Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. Hi, I'm J.R. Lowry, and this is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, which is brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you live the career you deserve, providing career coaching, content, courses, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise and join today. Today, my guest is Ellen Tafe. Ellen is a clinical assistant professor at the Kellogg School of Management, where she teaches personal leadership insights and is the director of the Women's Leadership Program. Outside of Kellogg, Ellen runs a leadership advisory consulting, speaking, and coaching business. She is also a TEDx speaker and an independent board member. She also recently wrote a book titled The Mirrored Door, Break Through the Hidden Barrier That Locks Successful Women in Place. Prior to her academic governance, coaching, and writing career, Ellen spent 25 years with Fortune 500 companies holding the top brand management posts at divisions of Pepsi, Royal Caribbean, and Whirlpool. She then pivoted into a growth stage small business as president of Ravel, a brand strategy consultancy to Fortune 500 clients. Ellen speaks and writes on a variety of topics and has been published in Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Business Insider, and the Washington Post, among others. She received her MBA from the Kellogg School and holds a BS from the University of Florida. She lives in the Chicago area. Ellen, welcome, and thanks for joining me today. Oh, I'm glad to be here with you, JR. Appreciate your time and opportunity to talk about your recent book, The Mirror Door, obviously playing off the concept of the glass ceiling, but describe what you mean by this concept of a mirrored door. Sure. The mirror door is uh, something that many women encounter across their careers many times. It's when we see opportunity and reflect inward usually in a distorted way and think we are not ready or worthy to move forward into action. And I see it in myself. I see it in my students, women I've coached, and I see it in the research as well. And you talk about it playing out across careers, but one of the points you kind of bring out in the book is that the things that often help women be successful early in their careers, you know, the preparation and the hard work and the pleasing others and playing it safe, It works to a point, but all of a sudden it starts not working. That's right. I've identified these five strategies that do make us successful, but there's an underbelly to them and they can put us in our careers or self-perception in a little bit of a peril. The book is full of examples and stories. Before we dive in in a little bit to those five things that you mentioned, can you share one or two of the stories that kind of help illustrate the kinds of situations that women often find themselves in where they lose the momentum that they built for themselves over the early part of their careers? Sure. So one is really the origin story that got me focused on this area. And, you know, after a corporate career, I joined my alma mater to teach MBA students. Um, So I was at Kellogg. I was the director of women's leadership program, where I still am. And I was at one of our first orientations, all excited for my new role and uh, to be able to help these amazing millennials advance their careers. And at the orientation, there was a female CEO who shared her story. And when she opened it up for questions, all the questions came from men and not one from a woman. And I was shocked. I asked the person next to me, like, is that usual? And she said, sometimes in the classroom too. And I know to get in this school, you need top scores. You need to have really accomplished a lot in your 20s. And so I know that these women were really capable. And when I met them, I confirmed that. But it sort of took me back to my own MBA orientation where I didn't raise my hands and other women in the room didn't either. Now, there were a lot fewer of us at the time, but it launched me into thinking maybe this was 
not generational, because I had thought millennials are going to take the world by storm, which I still think they can, but that there's something going on with gender. And I started to see that learn that was happening at other business schools and in other parts of women's careers. This like holding back, awaiting for the perfect, in this case, question or a perfect answer or the perfect self to move forward into the next promotion or the next job. You make the point about that being the origin story for your book. The origin story, I think, for a lot of women in this situation actually starts in their childhood, right? Where there's the different expectations, you know, the the idea that girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice and, you know, that that you shouldn't expect sort of outrageous behavior from girls in school, that boys will be boys and all of that. And I mean, that was a generation ago that that you were in school, I was in school, but here we are a generation later, it's still happening. So clearly there's something that's still going on in kids' childhood. Yeah, absolutely. And the research supports that too, but it's as if something is in the water that things have not changed as much as we would have thought generationally. Now, for sure, women and girls are advancing, you know, 70% of valedictorians in the U.S. are young women. So really attaching well to education and academics. But we learn some of these things early on about being a good girl, obeying authority, rising up and being superior towards others that stay with us, that works fine in school. But then when we get to the workplace, we don't necessarily take risks or adjust to some of the gray area. And boys, the, the pattern you know, that the research shows, boys learn a one-upmanship that must be hard as a little guy, I would think. But you're much more challenged as a boy to try things before you're ready. And I think that it teaches boys becoming men to go for things without knowing with 100% certainty that it's going to work or that you're going to be fantastic in the job and good for them. And so, so we see things like men going for jobs when they have six of 10 of the criteria and right. women, women waiting till they have all 10 when it's really the company's wish list. So these childhood things, we carry them with us and it's harder where there's more gray area in the workplace. That sense of confidence that you describe with men may be overrating their competence, whereas women perhaps underrate their competence. The comfort with ambiguity, the comfort with risk, are those the key things that are often holding women back that perhaps come more naturally to men because of the way that boys and girls are brought up or is there more to it? I think that there is a discounting that girls and many times women can feel of discounting all that we've already done, like all of our qualifications, our experiences. And I literally just talked to someone today on a session and she said her boss talked to her about going for this job that would put her in the C-suite and her immediate reaction was, oh no, I'm not ready for that. And the person that went for it actually had less experience. So there is this tie to preparation, to being 100% certain that contributes to us downplaying ourselves and our futures too. And so maybe you know, men become overconfident but, but I think what they're learning to do is to fake it till you make it and yeah. going for things and understanding that they're going to like how it works, that they're going to grow into a position. They don't already have to have mastered it. So good for them. We need women to take a page out of their book and do that for ourselves too. There's an element of imposter syndrome here, right? And you talk in the book about the notion of the, the voice, you call it the inner antagonist and talk about needing to find your inner protagonist. So, I mean, this does affect men too, but you make the argument that much more so women. Yeah. And I teach men and women and I'll hear imposter syndrome quite frequently. I think it's become part of the vernacular, Yeah, but I think that it is more intense and more frequent with women. 
but it cuts across uh, regardless of gender too. And it's important to understand and bring awareness to what is that inner antagonist or that critical voice. You know, I'll say, what are, what are the greatest hits in your mind that, you know, other people can't see, but what are those top five things that you say that make you question yourself and what's on replay? Just even taking that one thing, you know, I faced it even with writing a book or moving into academia very late in my career. Well, who am I to write a book? And I think the the solution is bringing awareness to it, but disrupting it through what's a counterpoint to that. And in my case, in that example, it's going from who am I to write a book to I have a message to share that can help people. And then it's not just a, it can help to put a post-it on your monitor or mirror to help you think that way, but taking the next step from mindset to action of if I really have a message that I can share that can help people, what action would I take? And for me, that's getting up early and writing, or it's doing more posts on LinkedIn to get the message out, even though I think, who am I to act like the authority? It's a discipline and it's practice and taking small steps to counter this narrative. Yeah. And ultimately you make the point that, you know, the narrative ought to be, why not me? Right. As opposed to who am I to whatever. Yeah. And I think just even the, why not me? I I think more boys and men have that and good for them. We need it too. Very true. So you mentioned these five attributes a little bit earlier in the conversation. Let's come to those. They can have, as you write a positive or a negative impact on your trajectory. The first of those is preparing to perfection, which you argue has to be let go. How so and and why is that important? So it certainly helps us. We become go-to people and deliver in an excellent way, but we tend to rely on preparation and certainty to be able to deliver this type of perfection and it becomes part of our identity. And so what happens is as expectations rise, as we rise in an organization, we don't have the amount of time to prepare like we once did. And we also need to delegate to others and have them do more of that. And it can create an internal stress when we're called to make decisions with less information, or we are called to manage other people and empower them versus micromanage them. So it can be a really stressful thing. And so that stress is a real problem to us internally. And sometimes it serves to have us hesitate and hold back because we are worried about what the downside is. You know, my students will say they have FOMO. I think there's also in all of us a a FOMU, fear of messing up. That is true for a perfectionist. And what also happens is there's not only the internal perception, the stress that goes on, but there is also uh, the perception outside of us can really impact our careers. We can go from being that person that is the go-to, that delivers, that becomes the worker bee that we want on our team, but is not someone we want to lead the team because we're not decisive or moving fast enough with less information. We're not taking the risks that are expected of leaders as we develop in our careers. You talk about a number of tips, you know, across all five of these areas, but on this notion of of working to perfection, is there one that really stands out to you more than the others in terms of helping women to kind of break that cycle and rethink the whole relationship they have with trying to be perfect? Yeah, I think it's being aware of it and getting mentoring on it. And most of all, I would hope that would be with your boss who can help you prioritize your work in ways that teaches you there are some things that you don't have to be perfect on. So in other words, what parts of your project list or all the things that you do, you need to deliver A plus work on and where can you go in with a draft or give it to someone else? And sometimes we are wanting to be so perfect on everything that we exert a lot of energy on things that don't really need it and we can move faster. 
but it takes a little bit of practice. So that getting help from someone who can help you to do that, asking for help, which is one of the hardest things for someone who is in this mindset. Yeah. I used to describe to people when they would ask me, you know, something that needed some work, you know, do you want the the two minute answer, the two day answer, the two week answer, you know, help me understand how much detail you want to go into. And that's a different way of thinking about a very similar thing to what you just described. Yeah. I really love that because what's the work that would make this decisionable? Uh, and, and I also think understanding what are the risks, because that ties also to what's the level of effort or completion or perfection yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it comes a little bit into sort of decision science, right? Which we won't get into today, but, you know, thinking about the upside, the downside, how much information kind of working backwards intuitively, you know, to what you need to figure out whether you're comfortable making that decision as opposed to trying to gather all the facts before you, you give it a shot. Yeah, I really love that because it can help move someone into the, with the information we had available, here's my recommendation. And it may not be perfect because we don't have perfect information. So I love that. For another day, we can go deeper. For another day, we can go deeper. The second one is is around this notion of eagerly pleasing. And it comes back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the nice girl. How, when you know those girls become women, how does that focus on pleasing get in their way? It goes from this learning that cooperation and other orientation is really powerful. It's, it's what we're really can be great at. Um, these are the people that, they're the glue that hold the team together. But what happens is sometimes we neglect our own opinion or our own needs and can even feel underlying anger or feel like I'm being taken advantage of here, but sort of don't know how to necessarily express something that is disagreement or conflict or even saying no. So there's sort of the stress that comes up is this, wait a minute, what about me? Right. Even though we haven't always served that up. And the, the perceptual risk that gets in our way is being seen as too soft or not able to make the tough decisions or face conflict. And some of the solutions here are really to unpack this being liked and this fear of disappointing other people and really opt for respect. And, and so often some of the people who feel this the strongest have the strongest relationships that can really withstand some amount of disagreement and it takes practice of setting boundaries, of addressing conflict. And, you know, I say tap into your courage to do this in the smallest way. It's building a muscle around getting your voice heard or your needs met through saying, saying no, and that that's a complete sense. As you become a more senior leader, you are going to make decisions that will not make everybody happy. And you have to get comfortable with that. And you know, without it, you will go into appeasement mode, right? Or compromise mode. And neither one of those necessarily is going to lead to the right answer and, and all, certainly won't lead to the right answer in all decisions. And you mentioned conflict as well. I mean, the best teams have some amount of conflict, right? So if if you're not willing to say something somewhat controversial, then you're probably not helping the team push the edge as much as it needs to. And so you are kind of playing it safe in those situations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of, you know, the mirror door is that reflecting inward of like, I'm going to lose this relationship or they're going to think worse of me. And to your point, as, as people move forward and move up in organizations and have to make the tough calls, some of the ways at that are getting input up front. And when you have made a decision, sharing with great transparency. That would be a great way for someone who is very so other oriented to make sure you're keeping people abreast of like why you made the decision. And that's how you also shift into not only being liked, but being respected also. Yeah. A related point, I think, is fitting the mold, right? Which is in some ways a different way of seeking to please, right? This idea of 
staying within the guardrails of the corporate culture. You know, you, you made a point in the book that resonated with me because I have said those words that women are held to a narrower set of acceptable behavior than men. And it's awful that that's the case, but there is truth in that. And we got to fix the workplace. But I think as you know, a woman or as a manager of a woman, you have to help them kind of understand that there is that perception difference that they have to be at least aware of. Absolutely. And fitting the mold, we're good at it because this other orientation that I mm. think comes with our upbringing does help us to read the room to understand what does success look like in this organization. And I think we adapt and are agile to fit in as a way of belonging. But if we're not showing more of ourselves, it's not really belonging. For your listeners, they might not see I'm wearing red here. And I tell a story in the book of being told to wear a Navy jacket early on in my sales career and kind of resisting that, you know, given I have dark hair and Irish fair skin, you know, Navy is it's not my color, <laughs> you know, red or something brighter would be. Now yeah. that's kind of an out of date example now, but there are other aspects of our identities that that we're in question about. Can I really show that? They hired me in one way, but can I, you know, I have a former student who interned in a company and she wanted to go work for them. And she was also thinking about, uh, she's a black woman. I want to be able to wear my natural hair. Am I going to be accepted? Am I going to be successful here? And so it also because of the workplace and the situations we're in, it calls on us to figure out, do I want to pioneer a new way or am I up for this or do I want another place? And so the more we as leaders in our organizations have different ways of showing who we are, obviously while being effective in the workplace, that the more that we can um, have women and, and other have everyone really not feel like they have to fit a mold. So I say break the mold or expand it in, in some ways. And it's really good to bring awareness to that, especially if you're someone who is part of the majority of the organization. These may be things that people aren't even aware of that others face too. And people yeah. with intersectional identities have multiple things, sometimes visible, sometimes not that they're thinking through, can I come out in this organization or yeah. other, can I share a disability that I have something like that? Yeah. And obviously one organization is different from another. And most organizations I think are making an effort to be more inclusive of the different types of people that will come and work there, but it does vary and it takes time. And to your point, there is a little bit of a trade-off, I guess you have to decide when you're in a population maybe that that feels in the minority about whether you want to push the envelope a little or a lot. It's very individual. Yeah. But leaders can help. Leaders can help. Yeah. And, and I want to come back to that in a minute. There's a couple more of your five that let's cover first. You talk about working pedal to the metal, right? Which obviously implies working crazy hard and you know doing everything. It's a little bit linked to this notion of working to perfection, but is that concept sort of grounded in, in an over-reliance on the idea of a meritocracy and and sort of an underappreciation of the fact that most work environments are not pure meritocracies? Um, I didn't think of it that way, but I think it could be. I think it's more reflective of someone's style of hard work and of likely being super competent but where this comes up a lot of times is a woman who is so focused on results and is highly competent, but those around her a lot of times are looking for like, where's the warmth? So this can be the falling prey to some bias of expectations of what I'm expecting to see in a woman. You know, where's the team building? Where's all those kinds of things? But yet we need people who are running hard on a project and leading the way. And so what happens is for sure it can lead to burnout too, especially because a lot of times you're leading the way and your team is further behind you too. The other part is creating that followership 
and building the relationships. There's research on warmth and competency. And I have a lot of coaching clients or students say, can I just get down to business? Do I have to like create all these sort of niceties? And there's a lot of energy expended on how do I build these relationships? But it is so important to slow down, to pause and come back and share what your intentions and motivations are. So, so often just explaining, I want us to jump right into this thing. We're going to have an aggressive schedule, but it's because I so believe in this product and I want it to go to market as fast as we can. They're counting on us. So you're sort of explaining who you are, but explaining to others so that they're not looking for something that is not coming as natural to you as well. Yeah. One thing that certainly I would argue has changed over the course of my career is leaders will slow down and explain the why more as opposed to just, you know barking in order and just expecting you to run out of their office and go do it. And I think this notion of being willing to show your true self and not feeling like you have to be this you know perfect, invincible superhero all the time, it's actually opened up a lot of different leadership styles that a generation ago, I think would have been harder for people to succeed with. I agree. And I do feel like, you know, older, uh, older workplaces had much more of that command and control. Right. Um, And now we're adding to it collaboration, compassion, the importance of sharing the why of who you are, as well as why we're doing the work we're doing. And we really need all of those things. And I think, think it opens up a much broader styles of leadership. And it's what employees want too. They don't want this, you know, just do it. Right. Worked for Nike, but not for leaders, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So last one, performing patiently, it sort of conjures this image of somebody, you know, just working hard and waiting for that, that promotion to come. You know, when and in what ways do women need to be more impatient? They need to share what they want and what they've done. It's kind of a myth to think that you're just going to be noticed by putting your head down, getting the job done. So often women and some men feel like I don't want to be, you know, self-promoting and that's like icky and, you know, disingenuous. And I think that comes from this childhood, don't be superior kind of thing. And we have to really rethink that to be much more about career planning. So if your boss doesn't know what you want, how can they advocate for you? And the risk here is that you can be seen as less ambitious as well. And then feel also that disappointment of what about me? So it's important to share and, and to also share what you've done as well. People are so busy, they don't know it if you don't share it. And I'm talking about more than just the annual performance review in yeah. that as well. It's a real mindset shift about the importance of you know what's called self-promotion, but it's really just about sharing what do you want and what have you done and having the courage to have these conversations and getting feedback on how are you tracking relative to what you want as well. We've talked about this from the woman's perspective, from the individual's perspective, but what what can managers, what can companies do to help women along this journey, right? To make sure that these five things don't necessarily become negatives for the women that they want to grow and develop in their organizations. It helps to be vulnerable because men have also, men and managers, women and men who kind of work through this, they have faced some of these issues. And so it it helps someone to feel like they're not alone if they hear an example of, I used to feel like it was hard for me to say what I really wanted or to have these difficult conversations. Here's what I've done. So being vulnerable is one way in, I think, looking for and sharing the potential that you see in others is also really important. Corn Ferry did a a study of like the top 2000, uh, the Russell 2000, the top female CEOs in that group. And 66% of them were told that 
they had the potential to be CEO before they realized it or thought about it themselves. So, so often women have not seen role models of someone like them, whether it's from their family, their neighborhood, or their past companies, to be able to recognize that they could ascend to higher levels too. And I would also just say, being candid with your feedback can be really helpful. It's tricky because subjective feedback is not helpful, but if we see as managers that someone's getting in their own way, how can we identify that and help them through, for example, there is a need to raise conflict. How can you coach someone in particular on how they can still retain the relationships they have, but be able to address conflict? But that's just part of the program. And so sometimes it's like, what is it on mirrors? You know, objects may appear bigger. It's sort of like these, these risks appear bigger so frequently. And so helping dissect that can also be another helpful thing for managers to do. Managers yeah. can really play a key role here um, just by being open and asking good questions as well. Absolutely. And you suggest some of those in that middle portion of the book, which I thought was really helpful. Last portion of the book, you kind of talk about grit and growth and gravitas. And you, you start by making the point, and we, you referenced it a little bit earlier, that courage needs to come before competence. Uh, describe how that really plays out in practice. Yeah. And to me, this was a big point because so often women get feedback of, you need to show more confidence. And it is something that is really hard to work with. It's not the best feedback because my belief is that courage is really the prerequisite for action and confidence comes from experiencing something that you've gained or maybe you've lost and you've gotten back up. And I think that so often if I ask a group of women to share examples when you were really confident, they have a hard time coming up with that. If yeah. I ask them to tell me three times when you showed courage and generally even coming to that session or getting an MBA or going for a job or having a child or all these things, they, there's a lot that makes women and girls very courageous. And that's what they can tap into to move into action or even to try these small steps, these small mini risks that can help them take the bigger risks later. And it's all about courage, but our society in every women's magazine or, you know, online, every conference is going to talk about confidence. And that's really the outcome. You mentioned as well that it takes a village, so to speak, yeah. that you need to rely on the community around you, whether that's mentors or sponsors or just a professional network. What are some of the specific roadblocks that the women that you work with encounter and how do you help them overcome them to build that community around them to help them have that role modeling that they need? One of the first ways is believing that asking for help is a weakness. And so there's a lot of going it alone. And some of that happens when you're the one or the only or one of the few in an organization, but it also can be a mindset of like head down, work hard, don't take the time to meet other people, but I'm also concerned about what will other people think if I reach out and say, I don't know everything. So the you're not alone is one part. The other part is rethinking about networking. Networking for many women and, and for some men too, but for many women, it feels disingenuous or even research shows that it, it feels for some people like it just makes me feel dirty. Like I'm asking mm. um, for a job here or, or um, it's, it's not, you know, it can feel transactional too. But in reality, women tend to be known for, this is where our childhood deep relationships can really help us. So one of the things that I outline in, in this chapter about taking a village is how to network in ways where you're thinking about it, like I'm just asking for directions. So figuring out number one, like what do you want to be mentored on? How can you be specific about your asks, which can be 
you're more likely to get acceptance of those asks and that that's an important way to be able to reach out to people versus the, can I pick your brain? So rethinking networking and how do you think of it as asking directions um, and learning someone else's story? How did you pivot from sales to brand management? Might be one that I would get. I think the other thing that we know from the research is that networking is really about building uh, relationships with people who are connected. But what they have learned in research of successful women and how they network is that they have a close-knit group of women that they connect with that, that serve to give them sort of insider tips or yeah. you know private information that enables us to go into new industries or companies and, and learn more about you know what's it like to work at this kind of company or even within your company, I'm thinking of shifting into that division, what's it like in that division or to work for this boss. And that those kind of deeper, closer relationships for women are really powerful. It's something that women appear in the research to need more of to help them navigate their careers and make some of those. So the driving the deep relationships is also important as well. Lastly, you talk about the idea of becoming a protagonista. Describe mm -hmm. what you mean by that. By that, I mean taking the lead in your life. You know, back in our English class days of what's the protagonist. And I think so often we are raised in ways to play small and be a bit more of a supporting player. And we do have a lot on our shoulders. It tends to be more caregiving and things like that. But I also think you can be the, the lead character in your own, the story of your career and life, even though you are caring for others in your life. So you can do both, you know, taking center stage in your life and believing that's not a bad thing. But many times it, it starts with giving yourself permission to step yeah. into that role as well. Before we we spend a few minutes on your own career, are, what were your your parting words of wisdom at the end of the book? that you would want our listeners or viewers to take away here too. Just the idea that our voices carry and, and that we can amplify other women's voices and ourselves and, you know, open the mirror door for those that follow us as well. So it's all about helping other, other women. And when we change things in the workplace, it benefits everyone, whether there's more flexibility or other benefits or ways of working, like we talked about adding collaboration and compassion and the why into our workplace. Those feel like more feminine things, but they're what everybody wants. We want the combination of things to get to a better workplace. And I think women are poised to um, step into their own center stage, but help others up there as well. Absolutely. So before you started teaching at Kellogg and, and working there, you had a very successful corporate career of your own. How and when did you walk through your own metaphorical mirror door? Uh, I'm always doing it. I feel like, I mean, I think, I think early on I had to learn how to promote myself. I think I was more the performing patiently. So I would say it came up for me with, how do I say what I want and share what I can do? I also think that I learned to tap into the care that I have for other people to be able to make tougher decisions, to give clearer feedback. And I really learned how to do that. I worked for Quaker Oats and PepsiCo. We just had tremendous training. But I realized like I'm doing a disservice if I uh, only say the good things to other people. So that was, I think, powerful for me to transition from being a little bit fearful of giving someone difficult feedback to be able to do that in a way that's caring and compassionate, but also is really clear. So I probably fell more on the like pleasing perfectionist scale, but then becoming a professor, something I hadn't done before and writing a book both were things that were really, I think, opening the mirror door of, you know, I got to do the best I can. It's not going to be perfect, 
but I'm drawn to do this. And for the, the sake of my career and, and for the sake of my students or readers, I need to move forward into action. How, how else did you change your own style as you became a more senior leader in the different organizations that you worked for? I became more open and shared more of myself over time and more of you know what my struggles were. I think I realized that I I am someone who's quieter and humble, a, a more of a, a thinker, but very empathetic. But I also sometimes got underestimated. So I became aware of that through great feedback from a mentor and boss. And it has helped me to be aware of that and to help show who I am because I can surprise people by how quietly driven I am. Now, you also serve on some boards. How have you found that experience relative to being a corporate executive? I love it. It, it enables me to focus on things like strategy and succession planning and talent development and learn about governance. So it it has me in the business world, but helping both the leaders of a company, but helping uh, to drive the strategy for where we want to go. Um, I had to learn that it is an oversight role. You're not management. And so one of the, you know, when I was a newer board director 12 years ago, learning it's much more about asking questions to know that management has done what they need to do or has thought about what could be around the corner. Right. Uh, and and uh and part of it, I years ago I can remember presenting an ad campaign to the board and some of the questions that I got about, you know, why is her dress green or whatever were completely unhelpful <laughs> at mm. the time before I was on a board. I thought I will never be that kind of board director. And so part of that experience guided me to make sure I'm elevating the game. I'm asking questions that can help management and can also make us deliver against our responsibilities to make sure we're guiding the company in a way that is going to be successful for all. You got certified as a board director. Did you do that before you joined your first board or was that part of your sort of learning process after you got your first board role? I did it much later. Uh, early on when I was interviewing for the first board, I went to Kellogg has a director development program for women. It was an executive education program. So I did that. And then before I joined my second board, I did a, a National Association of Corporate Directors, a professional director development training just to, you know, in both cases, help me to be better in the boardroom. And then I think it was just two or three years ago, I became a certified director. That was a newer program that NACD has offered. And I think as the demands in the boardroom, the risks, the, the new mm -hmm. topics that come up, it was actually preparing for it and taking the test where you do a lot of like case study yeah. kinds of answers. It was actually hard. And I was thrilled to, to pass <laughs> and to, uh, to become certified. A lot of my contemporaries are now wanting to join a board. What advice would you have for them in terms of getting that first board role? Uh, the first one is the hardest. Yeah. I think um, thinking through in what ways you can add value to a board. So thinking of your career in ways that could, where, what, ways could you guide boards versus being a manager or being a, a consultant? Sometimes I've seen we've interviewed people and you want to hire them as a consultant, but not as a board director. And then the, I think the biggest advice is network with people, let people know. And, and you could also get feedback You know, let people in your network know that you want to be on a board, get their feedback on, um, do they see that for you? What ways could you be more ready for that. But so often board director roles are done through networking. You know, you can also, if you have relationships with recruiting firms, ask to be introduced to their board practice. Right. Uh, but networking is your biggest way, uh, I think, to get in. It's still done 
that way. And I would also say, look at private companies too. Yeah. Why so? Um, I think there's many more of them. And I think it's easier to get on a private company board before a public one. Because you don't have to deal with all the public reporting topics that, yeah, that come yeah. with. It, yeah, It kind of helps you to prepare, uh, you know, so think of there's so many micro, you know, like small cap companies right. that are looking for more guidance as well. But there's thousands of them and a lot fewer of the um, the public company. I mean, maybe public company looks better on the resume, but it mm -hmm. also comes with a lot more work and, and a lot more risk too. True. You know, with True. the fiduciary responsibilities that um, might be heightened on a public company board. So what's next for you? What do you want out of the next few years of your career? Well, I was going to go after that, after this book came out. And since it just came out a week ago after our, uh, I'm still figuring that out. You know, I love, I love the board work. I love teaching. Um, and I really love this experience. Like right now I'm, you know, I'm going to spend a lot of the next year sharing this book. You know, my hope is that it becomes a more evergreen, you know, go-to book for women building their careers and their allies. So that's kind of the near term, more, more of the same, but also figuring out what do I dial back on to have a little bit more time, you know, our empty nest, my husband and I, you know, hope to travel a little bit more and that kind of thing. Any final career advice that you want to share for our audience? I would say run your own race, know who you are and focus on spending your time doing things that you could be really great at versus what someone else thought for you or or thinks you should do. So self-awareness to playing to your strengths so that you can enjoy all that time we spend working. Great advice. Well, thank you for doing this today. I appreciate it. Lots of great insight, not just for women, I think, but for for all professionals in terms of how to think about, you know, the ways that they need to adapt as they start to rise through the ranks. Absolutely. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Well, you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. I want to thank Ellen for joining me today to discuss her new book, The Mirror Door and its messages for women and men who are finding themselves stuck at the midpoints of their career, or maybe more generally. If you're ready to take control of your career, you can visit pathwise.io. If you'd like more regular career insights, you can become a Pathwise member. It's free. You can also sign up on the website for our newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.